Now, maybe you've seen these images before. They're useful. The equality image reminds us that if we think about um, a, uh, a framework of equality, then we'll say, let's give everyone the same thing. But in our photo here of three people trying to watch a soccer game over a high fence, when you give a box to the tall guy who can already see over the fence, well, you're just giving him an extra box, but he doesn't need it. And if you give a box to the shorter girl, she still might have a hard time being able to see over the fence. Really what she needs to be able to participate is two boxes. And if you give a box to the individual who is using a wheelchair, then it doesn't help them at all because the wheelchair can't sit on top of the box. You have to actually take the box apart and turn it into a ramp for accessibility. And so equity, right, rather than equality, doesn't look at giving every person the same thing. It looks at giving everyone what they need in order to enjoy the soccer game. It's a useful, I get it, it's a useful image, but let's push broader and deeper. What if instead of beginning with the equality frame, we start with what some people have called the reality frame, where the tall guy not only has one box, but a whole lot of boxes. Kind of a suggestion that those who already have end up having a lot more. And if you'll notice the smallest person here not only doesn't have one box, he's actually dug into a hole, right? Making him even smaller, trying to see this, in this case, baseball game over the fence. Again, equality gives everybody the same box and equity presumably gives more boxes to the person who's smallest and needs it the most. But check out that final frame. You see the final frame says, wait a minute, <laughs> why are we all standing around on boxes? The big question is, why is there a fence up? Now, I get it. I did have a student say to me, you know, Professor Harris Perry, now they're all gonna get hit in the face with the ball. So I get it. There's safety issues about why the fence might be up. But let me just suggest that if we move to a justice framework, instead of looking at the boxes, we start asking about the fences. In other words, what an equity framework tends to do is it focuses on individuals or groups and it presumes that some are deficient and that they require assistance. It kind of keeps us in a model that is about the deficits of some communities, about the fact that some people just aren't tall enough, or they're just not bright enough, or they're just not good enough, or they're just not something enough, and we have to go and help them. But a justice framework reframes that all together. And instead of focusing on the deficits in individuals or groups, it actually focuses on the structures, the policies, the practices, the assumptions. I'll give you an example that will work maybe for everybody living through the COVID-19 times. Last year, and again, even persisting into this year, many universities chose not to require the SAT or ACT as part of the application process, acknowledging that in the context of a global pandemic, that these scores would be biased, that they simply wouldn't reflect what students are capable of or their likelihood of being successful in college. Well, guess what? We already knew the SAT and the ACT were a big old fence, that they were a barrier to all kinds of communities doing a very poor job of predicting collegiate success. So maybe instead of just figuring out how to get test prep, we should maybe take down the fence, think about how we can have measures that are more just and more equitable at the same time. You see, justice frameworks acknowledge that there will be gain, but there will also be losses. What happens if you take down the fence of the SAT and ACT? Well, some folks who make a lot of money on test prep won't make that money anymore. But that's part of what justice is. It's about saying that in order to get to a fairer world, we may have to engage some folks having losses. And that's just it. Justice frameworks also require action. They mean we have to get out there and make those changes. So justice asks, Who's essential? 
if it's your cafeteria workers and your janitorial workers who are essential in a pandemic, guess what? That means they're always essential. And it's time to be sure that our universities are providing adequate resources to not only protect in the time of a pandemic, but also to ensure that those who are essential workers are earning living wages. Justice asks, whose land? If you're operating in a framework of justice, then you begin each event by in part acknowledging where you are, whose land you're on, who's been there before you. For the indigenous land acknowledgement, it's not only about sort of having some words to say, it's about really connecting to the fact that we are built on a history and that history is sometimes unjust, and that as we move forward, we are benefiting from that history and that at the minimum, we can acknowledge it. Justice asks, who's wealth? This is a reminder that, the, that Georgetown University actually sold human beings into intergenerational chattel bondage in order to keep the university open. So Justice asks not, can we give the extra box to the person who is shorter? It might ask whether or not that short person is actually the one who made the boxes. Is it really helping if what you're doing is in fact simply acknowledging that after all, that wealth came from these bodies, from these communities, and from these sacrifices? And justice always affirms that we are all welcome. We do not all have to agree. We don't all have to vote for the same political party. We don't all have to choose to uh, present ourselves to the world in the same way. But a just community always welcomes everyone as fully human.